morning. It is a real joy to be here with you today. Um, and I hope that that's how you feel as well when you come to church each day, that it is a joy to be here. You've made a decision when you woke up this morning to spend your morning in church. And I hope that you'll find that that is a good decision. A decision that as you leave this place having sung and prayed and heard scripture revealed, that you will say it was a good choice. I hope that's the case. Uh, because I, I'm aware that the, the pressure on me to make sure that I say something smart for you this morning. <laughs> It's truly a joy. Uh, this church has a significant relationship with the work of Bethany Kids. And so I have to begin by saying thank you to all of you who've made this church your home for the years. Uh, this church has allowed us to do some absolutely extraordinary things on the continent of Africa. To train surgeons, to provide care for children in many different countries. So for all of that work that we've been able to accomplish to you, I say thank you for your partnership in the gospel. Think of Paul's language as he says, every time I think of you, I pray with joy and thanksgiving for our partnership in the gospel. And that is what we have here today, that we partner in the gospel. You'll see on the screen a photo of some of our work. And I wanted to share with you before we get into our scripture, uh, a little bit about who we are. So that if this is your first time here, or if you've been part of this church and you just weren't sure what Bethany Kids was, that you'll have an opportunity to learn just a bit more. So we train pediatric missionary surgeons. That is to say, we train clinically, we train medical physicians, they are pediatric surgeons, and we also train them as missionaries. And these are people coming from the continent of Africa. So we work within Africa, that is where our projects take place. We train at a mission training hospital in the country of Kenya, and we have our fellows come to us from all across the continent to, to train for three years for their pediatric fellowship. And with us, that is, uh, again, a clinical training program so that they can be a licensed, accredited pediatric surgeon and also so that they can have tools and resources for what it looks like to practice as a missionary, to be a pioneer in their home country as they return to their homes. So after three years with us, they return to their home countries. And we face a number of challenges when they do that. The first greatest challenge we face is that many of these hospitals are, are poorly resourced and cannot afford to fund a pediatric surgeon. And in some cases, that's the only pediatric surgeon in the entire country. But the hospitals can't afford it. And so uh, one of our, our greatest sort of ways to support these physicians is that we pay them a salary. Now, if you know American salaries, uh, or if you know what an American surgeon might make, uh, it, this is considerably less. 35000 a year is what it costs for us to have a pediatric surgeon in a country. 35000 is a little bit less than a, a surgeon in the United States, I imagine. Is that, is that right? Yeah. So you know, I'll just say this clearly. If you're a surgeon, I have big plans for your money, and I'd like to meet you at the booth afterwards. Yeah. <laughs> Amen. To that. I like the clapping in the back. <laughs> Um, I, would, I would love to partner with you because think of the return on investment. When we can resource a missionary who serves in their home country, there's no language training to be done. There's no cultural training. These folks are missionaries and they serve in their home countries. And they practice the gospel of Jesus as a missionary providing care for children. We care for about 3,000 children every single year. We not only train those surgeons, but we provide the pediatric surgery in seven countries. And when we provide pediatric surgery, it's coming from a place of Jesus-centeredness. Now, that's difficult to do in some countries where uh, medicine and spirituality are at opposite ends of the world. But when we practice our faith, we practice in the hospital, and we practice in the hospital with our faith, because the two can't be separated. Our people are missionary surgeons, and so then when they care for patients, they're praying with patients. They're caring for their families. They're ensuring that the whole body, the whole being, spiritual and physical, receive care. As you can imagine, uh, even providing good surgery with well-trained physicians, uh, there are other things that have to happen. So physiotherapy, occupational therapy, spiritual care. So we provide holistic care to the children and families that we serve. We train the surgeons, we provide the surgery, and then we provide holistic care. Our goal is not only that the children who see us, that if they need uh, therapy or if they need a wheelchair, that they would get that from us, but also that they get a Jesus-centered approach to everything we do. So that when they leave, we would hope to connect them with a church in their home community so that they would have the resourcing as a family to care for the children that they have. The reality is many of the children who come to us are coming to us in some of the worst circumstances you can imagine. 
Most children don't go for pediatric surgery because they're just in the mood for it. They go because of a crisis or a congenital condition that has afflicted a family, and that condition sometimes leads a family into profound poverty because they cannot afford to care for the child. Uh, one, just to, one example, we had early on in our ministry, um, we had the, the founder of our organization adopted some of the children he was caring for because one of them was found in a dumpster pile because the family could not care for them. So when I say that we are literally saving lives, I mean that literally, not in the figurative sense, but truly, literally, the work that we do saves lives because people are in desperate need of healers, and that is what we provide. Now, I want to be clear before we get to the scripture, I am not the healer. I'm not a surgeon. Our surgeons are in Africa providing surgery. And they don't have the opportunity to come and raise money and raise awareness. So today as I come around, and this is my third week traveling around the United States with my young family. We're wandering around speaking at churches and and dinner parties in people's homes because we are trying to raise enough money to continue this work. Trying to invite more churches to join with the same generosity and faithfulness that this church has partnered with us. So if you are one of those people who's just in Florida for the, for, the, for the winter, whatever that is outside, it doesn't feel like winter, but if you're here and you've got a church in the north, I'd love to talk to you as well because we would love to get more churches to follow in the footsteps of this beautiful place right here and fund this work. In the next six months, I've got to somehow find an extra quarter million dollars. So that's the one surgeon in the room who's going to help me. I guess that's covered. Uh, no, I, I, I have a good deal of work that I need to do to fundraise so that these people in the field have the tools and resources and time to do the work that they need to do. So if you want to hear more about that, I will be at the booth. But you have come here to see and hear scripture read. So I want to do that with you. And I want to look at the passage that you heard read by my colleagues and some of the patients that we serve. Uh, and if you want to find it in your Bibles, it's Mark chapter 5 where we'll be looking And when you read the Gospels, you hear story after story of Jesus healing people. And so I have chosen this story from the Gospel of Mark. And typically, the Gospel of Mark is the shortest, most succinct reading of every story. It's the opposite of who I am as a person, it seems. But Mark is quick, typically, like an action-packed movie. He, He goes through the events very quickly, oftentimes not even giving names. But this passage happens to be totally different. This passage, Mark, is one of the longer passages of this healing story, and he adds, deal, he adds details that none of the other Gospels include. And so to me, when you have someone add details who are usually very short on details, it gives us pause to reflect and think something important is happening here that we should pay attention to. Mark, for a very specific reason, is giving us details that no one else is giving us, and we should pay attention to them. So I invite you to begin, and it'll be on the screen as I read it. I invite you to read it in your own scripture so you can see it on the page before you. And we read this story of how Jesus transforms lives. It begins with this. When Jesus had again crossed over by boat to the other side of the lake, a large crowd gathered around him while he was by the lake. Then one of the synagogue leaders named Jairus came, and when he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet. He pleaded earnestly with him. My little daughter is dying. Please come and put your hands on her so that she will be healed and live. So Jesus went with him. This story starts, for me and my work, it starts in a way that we see thousands of times a year. There's a family who is desperate for healing care of a physician. Desperate for transformation. This man is is falling at the feet of Jesus in desperation because his daughter is dying. And as a human level, I think we can all understand that and maybe relate to that. If you've had a child or a grandchild, if you have a a friend or family member who has been unwell, and you think of the, the earnest prayers of Jesus, please heal this person. This is the synagogue leader, Jairus. He comes to Jesus with that attitude. And it's important to note that typically, and you think about this, typically when you see a religious leader in the Gospels, how are they behaving? Think about that for a moment. I I see some head shakes, right? If you were to define in one word the relationship between the religious elite and Jesus in the scriptures, how would you, what word would you use? 
I've heard a few words and I'm guessing they're probably all pretty good, but animosity and, and there's this tension, there's this friction because typically religious leaders are trying to trick Jesus with a test or a quiz, some theological loophole that they're looking to catch him in in order to prove that he's something that he says he's not. They want to get him in trouble. But this religious leader comes to Jesus with a totally different posture comes to Jesus in desperation. Jesus, would you please heal my daughter? It says he, he falls at the feet of Jesus. He is desperately pleading for his daughter's life. That is a significant contrast to any religious leader that we've met in the scriptures. And then Jesus says, yes, and he goes with him. And you think that's an extraordinary moment. And you could stop there and say what a beautiful day it has been because Jesus listens and responds to those who are broken. But something happens as the story unfolds, as it often does. And typically, some of the most amazing things that happen as we read the Gospels are things that happen while Jesus is going from one place to another. Right? If you think that the most important thing today is going to be where you've already scheduled, realize that most of the exciting things Jesus does are happening as en route. Happening when it wasn't in the plan. You know, meeting someone at the well or en route down a road. Here, while he walks to Jairus' home... A woman comes up, and you'll see in the scriptures, this is how it continues. A large crowd followed and pressed around him. And a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had, yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. And when she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak because she thought, if I just touch his clothes I will be healed immediately her bleeding stopped and she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering what a tremendous moment a tremendous miraculous supernatural moment where Jesus's presence has has literally physically healed a woman And it's important to note that this woman, of course, she sneaks up on Jesus quite differently than Jairus. Jairus is a public leader, a religious leader. He's someone that the community knows. In fact, we know his name. We don't know this woman's name. And she comes up against Jesus and believes in her heart that if she would just touch the robes of Jesus, that she would find healing. Immediately, she is healed. It's easy to read a story like that and just give a quick round of applause and say, that's wonderful. Jesus healed yet another person. But 12 years of bleeding. 12 years is a long time. And if you think 12 years isn't a long time because you're someone who says, oh, time's going by so quickly, enjoy the moments. Where were you 12 years ago? What were you doing? Maybe you're working in a different state. Maybe uh, you have a grandchild today that didn't exist 12 years ago. There are so many things that can change in 12 years. And year after year, this woman suffered. Year after year, she bled. And I don't want to get too graphic with you this morning, but she couldn't just go to the CVS to get resourcing for that, to catch my drift. Dirty rags washed in a river is what she would have been using to care for herself. She was considered by the population around her as an unholy, unclean woman who you would not touch, you would not have share a meal with you, and who would not join you in the synagogue or the temple. She was unclean on the margins of society. And she sneaks up on Jesus and she touches his robes. And immediately she's physically healed. But something interesting happens in the text because she doesn't just slip back into the crowd and and disappear going on her merry way. Let's read and continue and see what happens because Jesus does something interesting. At once Jesus realized that power had gone out from him. He turned around in the crowd and asked, who touched my clothes? You see the people crowding against you, his disciples answered. And yet you ask, who touches me? But Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. Then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at the feet at his feet. And trembling with fear, told him the whole truth. He said to her, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering it sort of raises the question as to why Jesus needed to have this moment. She was already physically healed, right? She had touched his garment, that's it. She could have slipped away, we never would have read. But Jesus pauses the whole entourage that was heading to Jairus' house and says, who touched my clothes? And this woman comes up initially with, with significant fear. 
And again, you think, why is she so afraid? This is the woman, this is the man who just healed her. But remember, this was a woman who was considered unclean and unholy. And to touch a woman like that would be to make yourself unclean and unholy. That was the kind of community that they were living in. And as much as that sounds like it's a far cry from where we are today, I imagine that some of the same habits exist even in our own societies, where we see people as too unclean or too unholy to join us for worship, to follow Jesus. His disciples were confused as they usually are. I don't know if you find yourself um, relating to the disciples, but every time Jesus does something, they seem baffled. <laughs> right, Jesus? I mean, why are you asking these questions? You know, there's a big crowd around. It's, it's Black Friday. Everyone's here. Like, there's, there's this huge crowd. How could you be surprised that someone would touch you? But Jesus insists, who touched my clothes? And the woman comes up on her face. Again, think of the parallels between her and Jairus. And what does Jesus say to her in that moment? What does he call her? Right. You are my daughter. What a profound thing to say to someone whose family likely walked away from her when she was unclean for 12 years. What a profound thing to say to someone who has no relationships and no community, no spiritual community to depend on. Someone who is excluded from society to say, you are my daughter your family. We belong together. What a beautiful invitation. Moments ago in the passage, we saw that Jesus healed her physically. But in this moment, there's a spiritual, emotional, relational, cultural healing that takes place because she once again belongs after 12 years of not belonging. 12 years of being unclean, she has been made clean, not just physically, but by the touch of Jesus, the supernatural power of his presence. He has announced to everyone around, this is my daughter. That's a tremendous thing to say. In fact, it's as I know it, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but as far as I know, in the Gospel of Mark, that's the only time Jesus refers to anyone as his daughter. We already met a daughter, Jairus' daughter, but Jesus looks at this woman and says, you are my daughter. That's profound. And in fact, there's some other things that, that are interesting to me. Again, Mark is someone who adds details. It tells us, he tells us that she spent everything she had trying to get well. That's a story I know very well working in this work. People spend everything they have in a desperate campaign to get well. Mark refers to it as bleeding. And the initial word that he uses that translates in, for us, it says she suffered for 12 years, but she was scourged for 12 years. Does that word ring a bell if you know your stories in scripture? Where have you heard someone of bleeding and being scourged in scripture? Isn't it interesting that the words that Mark uses to define this woman in this moment, this daughter of Jesus, Mark is using the same words he uses to describe Jesus. It's incredible to me. And that, that lifts it off the page. This unnamed woman, this foreigner, this unholy, unclean woman who walks up to Jesus is suddenly elevated in this story and finds profound healing. It's a great reminder to all of us of the role that we can have because each one of us, no matter where we've been and what sort of situations we've been involved with, no matter how unholy we think we are, Jesus offers us love and healing. That's a beautiful story. And, and if we stop there, we could celebrate this woman. And, and it's, we're talking about the past sometimes. And it feels like it, it's 2,000 years ago and we live in a different world. So I wanted to quickly share a story about a colleague of mine who I think you'll hear as I share her story that there are some parallels to the scripture. And you'll see on the screen, this is Francesca. And Francesca uh, is a tremendous human being. Uh, she works with us and just is, is a joy, an absolute joy. And when she was born, she was born in an area or a community within Kenya called the Samburu region. Just next to the Maasai, if you're familiar with the Maasai, you might see them on TV or National Geographic. Very culturally quite similar. And one of the things that happened in her community, when she was born, and, and maybe you've been there for the birth of a child, maybe you've birthed a child, and aside from the sleeplessness and the, the, you're tired and you're physically broken, typically there's a sense of joy and excitement for new life. And as a Christian, when you see a new baby, you see that this is someone created in God's image, created by the divine. That's extraordinary. As a Christian, that's our worldview, isn't it? That we are made in God's image. His breath fills our lungs. But she was born in a community that when she was born with a, a physical disability called spina bifida, she was born with that community and her community saw her as a curse. That's how they viewed her. 
And in fact, it, not just in, in a metaphoric sense, but they saw her as a curse that was so dangerous to their community that they had to remove this child. And her grandparents fed her poison to try to kill this beautiful little baby. This baby that we as Christians know was created in God's image. But her community saw her as a curse. Her community, like the woman in the story, saw her as someone who was unclean, unholy, and to be kept apart from society. It's this tragic story, and I'm telling you a true story. And then this woman, as she grew up, her mom uh, ran away with her when she was young to protect her life, but that didn't solve things because she still had a condition that was complicated, a medical condition that meant that her bladder was leaking for most of her life. You can imagine that experience, not just 12 years in her case, but well into her teenage years, she couldn't control her bladder. And if you think that's inappropriate to talk about in church because a woman couldn't control her bladder and smelt like urine just remember the woman we met a moment ago who came to Jesus because this woman felt the same way she was isolated from her community and was not able to be fully embraced and loved and in fact one of the the darkest moments in her life when she was a teenager was when her entire family went to a wedding leaving her behind because she was unclean and she smelled bad that was her life And at that moment, she tried to take her own life, wishing that her grandparents had been successful. When I say that the communities that we serve, there's a desperate need for the healing power of Jesus. This is the kind of thing I'm talking about. There are people whose cultural worldview or whose physical condition has made it impossible to feel loved. And this woman managed to find her way to our hospital in Kenya through a friend of a friend, and and she was able to find physical healing and treatment for her condition. Not just physical treatment, but a healer who actually looked at her with love, compassion, and with the eyes of Christ. As a child of God, that's how we saw this woman. When we look to Francesca, we see that this is a beautiful creature created by the Creator. That is not how she experienced life before that. So you can imagine the transformation that happened in her life. Like the woman we read in the text, her whole life transformed and she began to follow Jesus for the first time. She began to uh, read her scriptures and eventually go on now that she, she teaches children and she serves with Bethany kids to help other kids who are facing the exact same condition. It is amazing what happens when someone actually looks at someone who is different, who is set apart and treats them the way Christ treats you with love and empathy and compassion. This is Francesca, and her story, I I hear it in the back of my head when I read this text, because this incredible moment of God saying, you are my daughter and you matter, is the same kind of offer that each one of us have been given as Christians, that you are a son or daughter of the divine. That's incredible when your family has abandoned you. Even if your family hasn't abandoned you, to know that the God of all creation says, you are my child. That's significant. When Bethany Kids started just about 20 years ago, and we took this name, Bethany Kids, it was not just to to honor the, the biblical place of healing, Bethany, but rather it was named after the founding surgeon's daughter because he wanted to make sure that every child he treated was treated like his own child. That is the heartbeat of our work. That when we provide surgery, when we provide care to a child, we we have the same passion and desperation that any parent would have for their child. That's how we care for children. And that, I believe, is radically transformative. Now, of course, that also comes at a cost because while we're celebrating Francesca and we're celebrating this woman who was healed in the street and anyone who's seen that healing, it's easy to rejoice. But there's probably one person in that crowd who's thinking, get on with it. Who's that? Who do we meet at the beginning of this story? who is desperate for his own daughter to be healed, and he's waiting. What's his name? Jairus. Jairus has been waiting, and he sees this miracle. And maybe part of him is thinking, oh, that's great. Jesus is warming up. He's going to take care of my child first. But remember, this was a man who would have helped ensure that that woman didn't get into the synagogue because she was unholy and unclean. And she just cut the line, right? I don't know how you've ever felt in traffic when someone cuts the line, or in Starbucks or something. You feel that, right? And you feel very holy in church and then you get out to dinner and someone gets served before you and you're like, goodness gracious, what's wrong with this restaurant? (laughs) You know, 
Jairus is standing there, and I don't want to assume too much of his motives, but I can say this. He's standing there watching this happen. And just as he sees the miraculous power of Jesus take place for this unholy, unclean woman, someone from his house arrives. And you can see the story continue. It'll be on the screen. While Jesus was still speaking, some people came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue leader. Your daughter is dead, they said. Why bother the healer anymore? Overhear, or the teacher anymore. Overhearing what they had said, Jesus told him, don't be afraid, just believe. Now, typically when someone says that kind of language to you, most of us roll our eyes. When you've just had a tragic loss and someone says, don't worry about it. God, God's going to do this for good. You're thinking, my daughter has passed away. I don't need that platitude today. There's a profound depth of sadness that we might experience. But Jesus very quickly continues the story. You'll see it on the screen here. This is what happens next. He did not let anyone follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. And when they came to the home of the synagogue leader, Jesus saw a commotion of people crying and wailing loudly. And he went in and said to them, why all this commotion and wailing? The child is not dead, but asleep. They laughed at him. After he put them all out, he took the child's father and mother and the disciples who were with them, and he went where the, uh, where the child was. He took her by the hand and said to her, Talitha kum, which means little girl, I say to you, get up. Immediately, the girl stood up and began to walk around. She was 12 years old. At this, they were completely astonished. He gave strict orders not to let anyone know about this, and he told them to give her something to eat. What an extraordinary ending to this story, where both the wealthy, privileged daughter of the religious leader is cured and saved and brought back from the dead, and the woman in the street, the social outcast, at opposite ends of the spectrum, Jesus shows up and provides healing. With both the, the well and the unwell, Jesus provides healing. It's an incredible thing to consider. And, and it's wild to think that 12 years is mentioned twice, isn't it? The daughter was 12. The woman bled for 12 years. And for both those people, Jesus provided healing. Now, what that means for you as we apply it every day when you come to church, you have a different opportunity to apply your scriptures, right? I mean, you came to church to hear the scriptures read. You didn't know I would be standing here. So it, my presence here almost is irrelevant. The scripture has been read and you have an opportunity to consider what to do with it. To consider how you might be a loving, healing presence to someone who's suffering. And maybe that person's in this room. Maybe that person's in your home life. Our tendency as a people is to watch when suffering takes place. Right? Does that happen? You see someone hurting and you watch. And there's a crowd in there, a crowd of nameless people that we heard about. And there's disciples who, they're not watching, but they're asking foolish questions. And if we are to follow the teachings of Jesus, then our opportunity is to look and see what Jesus does and to go and do likewise. Not to watch and gawk as the crowd might have. Not to ask foolish questions as the disciples did. But to actually show up in the lives of people who are hurting and do something about it. And so I don't know what your life is like. I don't know what your circumstances are like. I don't know how you live. You might be in the largest house in the community. You might have just rolled in and, and, and maybe you're sleeping in a hotel because of a hurricane. I have no idea your life circumstances. And I cannot tell you exactly what to do with this scripture. Except to say that when I read scripture, my usual lens is this. Jesus saves you. Jesus loves you. And if you want to follow him and see him as your teacher, then copy his example. And in this passage, what I see is profound love for people of all walks of life. Now, for you, that means that the way you're going to show love is to walk over to my booth and hand me a check for $100,000. That's great. That's wonderful. That's truly, I need it. That would be great. But I want to be clear that, that there is a lot of other ways that you and this church can serve your community. And you've already heard about some of them whether it be ringing bells for the Salvation Army, whether it be making sure that children uh, have a time of joy this Christmas, whether it means helping those people who have been hurt by the hurricane, whatever it is that you choose to do when you leave this space, know this, God loves you. And if you choose to follow him, he asks you to do the same thing to your neighbors. Would you bow your heads with me as we pray? 
Jesus, I pray for those who are hurting this space right now. I pray for those who are unwell. I pray for those who um, are having a difficult time. And we pray for them and I pray for, for us as a community that we would stand around them and actually support those who are suffering, those who are hurting. I think of this community, even in Bonita Springs in the broader area of Southwest Florida, I think of those who are profoundly affected by this natural disaster. Would you allow your supernatural power to use your church to be a source of healing and hope and redemption for brokenness? God, I pray for ministries like ours around the world that depend on the generosity of people. I pray that your church would continue to set the example to this world that your people care for their neighbors, that your people love their neighbors. I pray in all things, Heavenly Father, that as we go from this place, we as your community would be known first and foremost for our love. We pray this in your matchless name. Amen. Amen. Oh!